So, Brother David, good morning. Good morning. We are sitting here in the wonderful garden of the monastery of Gudaich, and I'm happy that you have time that we can make this little interview. There will be a big celebration in the States honoring the 100th birthday of Thomas Merton. Um, and uh, the organizers of this conference would have enjoyed your attendance, but unfortunately, uh, that is not possible. So, Anthony asked me if he could make an interview to show at the conference, and you said on Easter Sunday, of course, we will do that. So, Brother David, my first question would be, when and how did you have personal contact with Thomas Merton? Uh, well, uh, the first time I met him uh, was when my abbot of Mount Xavier, a monastery in the United States, took me uh, to Kentucky to meet Thomas Merton there. And uh, whenever I remember that our meeting, uh, there also comes to mind a poem by Mark Van Dorn, uh, who used to be Thomas Merton's teacher. And uh, after Merton entered the monastery, uh, visited him there for the first time. And he wrote this poem, which I think is, uh, to me, a very moving poem. And I will try to recite it as best I can. Uh, Mark Van Dorn calls it Once in Kentucky. And he writes, In our fat times a monk, I had not thought to see one, nor ever, if ever with my own poor lean concerns ever to be one. No, but in Kentucky, midway of sweet hills, when housewives swept their porches and march light lapped window sills, he, once my merry friend, came to the stone door. And all the difference in his smiling was, it sorrowed more. His merriment was graver, as if he knew now where it came from and what the flavor he tasted it, the joy, then gave it all to me, as much, I mean, as I could carry home to this country, this country whose laughter is a fat thing and dies. I stepped across its body and remember still those eyes. Uh, and this is a sort of romantic uh, version of meeting Merton, but it is also uh, in my own experience. And on the other hand, when I first saw him, he wasn't wearing the monastic habit, but uh, uh, his work outfit, his overalls, and I thought he was the milkman because he was carrying big milk cans. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and also one thing that I remember from our first meeting and from uh, every meeting with him, he was always so jolly, uh, as Mark Van Duan says. He, he, uh, he tasted it, the joy. He was always tasting the joy of life and gave it all to me. One couldn't talk with him for five minutes, and he was all, we were all rolling with laughter. He always had something funny to tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that in, uh, impressed me most of him, that he w it was obvious that he had this deep uh, spirituality, as Mark Van Dorn says, as, as if he knew now where the joy came, f started from and what the flavor really was. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he really was full of joy uh, also in a simply everyday human way. Mm -hmm. So it might be there's already an answer to my second question. Uh, what was the most important impact of Thomas Merton's work or spirituality 
on your own path? Well, uh, I asked him once uh, if the things that he wrote uh, about uh, our Christian faith, mm -hmm. uh, if he could have written those same things if it wasn't for his encounter with Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, Zen Buddhism above all. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually when you asked him a question like that, he would just laugh it off and give you some quick answer. Yeah. But in this case, uh, he uh, said, well, I'll have to think about that. And then a little while later, he came back and he said to me, you know, uh, this question about Buddhism, I think I could not understand our Christian faith the way I do if it wasn't in the light of Buddhism. And that was very important to me because it also encouraged me on my own path to understand uh, our own Christian tradition uh, more deeply through my contact with yeah. Zen Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, had a, a great deal of uh, contact with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, for instance, and with uh, Suzuki, uh, not Junryu Suzuki, but uh, uh, the TC uh, Suzuki, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, the earliest books, really, that introduced uh, Zen to the United States. Uh, but he didn't have the practical experience which I had because I was studying at the Sendo. Yeah. So I was interested in uh, his uh, much more developed theoretical insight, and he was more interested in my practical experience. So it was a, a very interesting and, and fruitful encounter we had. So, Brother David, Thank you for this answer, and from your practical experience from today, what could be your message to the conference? Well, first of all, I'm very happy that I can meet you, um, all my our friends in Kentucky, in this way at least. And uh, I think for all of us it is important to continue, to, to honor Thomas Merton by continuing uh, in our time, what he uh, set in motion. And that is uh, a deep understanding uh, of other traditions, uh, in his case, particularly Zen Buddhism, uh, not on a superficial way, uh, but uh, it, by going so deeply in our own tradition that we reach the point where all the traditions originate. And uh, I can hardly imagine anything that is more important in our time than uh, a, a deeper understanding between religious traditions. And if we uh, work on it personally and uh, each of us and all of us together, uh, I think this is, will be the best way uh, of honoring Thomas Merton uh, on, on his 100th birthday. Thank you so much, Brother David, for this interview, and I think we send together best wishes to the conference. Yes, all the good wishes to all of you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Well, the first thing to uh, say about my spiritual journey is that I love beer, and by that very fact, I love the world. <laughs> Uh, surely, Owsley, there's a bumper sticker in there that we can sell to um, <laughs> raise funds for next year's uh, festival. I'm honored to be here, and it's just a delight and a pleasure, so thank you for welcoming me and for the invitation. When I was eight or nine years old, music was my doorway, really my first teacher into a life of wonder uh, and of experiencing the hidden presence of God. Long before I had ever heard of Thomas Merton, when I was seven or eight years old, learning to play the piano was my initiation into a life and a world charged with grace, with the grandeur of God. Now, our piano lived in the basement and I was scared of the basement. Every afternoon, reluctantly but dutifully, I would reach out my hand uh, as I walked down the stairs, groping in the dark, until I found the small lamp that sat on top of our piano in the basement. 
A turn of the switch in the old console lit up before me. And those moments of relief and of silence as I settled onto the bench seemed almost magical. The monsters now scattered. I could breathe again. And as I struck the first chords, feeling the hammers strike against strings and vibrate through my body, I seemed to dissolve into the sound, no longer conscious of time or really even of myself as a separate observing being. The play of music seemed to take my breath away and give it back to me in the same stroke. I was alive, reminded that this life, this being is charged with grace. But there was darkness too and foreboding as I learned to improvise across minor keys and dissonant modes. The piano perhaps teaching me the art of careful attention, of deep listening and discernment. Behold, pay attention, life will come before you in so many keys and disparate colors. Oftentimes, I remember my father calling down to me from the top of the stairs for dinner. I would stop playing and draw a deep breath and whisper into the dark basement air, thank you. To whom I imagined saying those words as a nine-year-old, I'm not sure. Yet I always felt, and I still do feel, a palpable sense of presence at the piano a someone or something other than me, with me yet also paradoxically rising from, from me and bearing my spirit into the rhythms of the day. Now, the rationalist might hear my story and citing a host of empirical studies explain such phenomena as the explosion of neurons firing throughout my nervous system and developing brain as a young child. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree. The neurological explanation bears its own beauty and complexity, but does it account for the whole experience? Is it possible that I really was tuned into something more than myself, something more elusive than the play of neurons firing across synapses inside my own head. Looking back over the course now of 50 years of my life, it is really Thomas Merton, more than any other, who gifted me with a language and a kind of a mirror in his own life and writings for affirming such experiences of wonder, of grace, and of presence. It may seem like a cliche, but more and more, I can see how Merton's writings have served me my whole life long in a way analogous to music, tilling the fields of my religious imagination. Merton reassured me from a very young age that those hidden seeds, as he called them, seeds of contemplation, were real, that they were significant, and that they were trustworthy. I was 15 when my mother gave me an old copy of The Sign of Jonas. And some days later, I came upon a passage at the very end called Firewatch, July 4th, 1952, one of Merton's most celebrated meditations. And it begins, as many of you will know and remember, if you've, if you've read the passage, with Merton putting on his sneakers and throwing the clock over his shoulder as he began to make the rounds through the monastery in the deep dark of night, checking for fire, a, a task that was assigned to one monk every evening. And the passage climaxes as he, as he swings open the door out on the roof of the monastery. And I'll just read a, a section that kind of burned itself into my brain as, as a 15-year-old when I first read it. He writes, mists of damp heat rise up out of the fields around the sleeping abbey. The whole valley is flooded with moonlight, and I can count the southern hills beyond the water tank. 
and almost number the trees of the forest to the north. Now the huge chorus of living beings rises up out of the world beneath my feet, life singing in the watercourses, throbbing in the creeks and the fields and the trees, choirs of millions and millions of jumping and flying and creeping things. I lay the clock upon the belfry ledge and pray cross-legged with my back against the tower and face the same unanswered question. Lord God of this great night, do you see the woods? Do you hear the rumor of their loneliness? Do you behold their secrecy? Do you remember their solitude? Do you see that my soul is beginning to dissolve like wax within me? And much later in my life, it was the prose poem Hagia Sophia, Merton's hymn to holy wisdom, the feminine presence of God alive and at play in the world, which captured my imagination. Hagia Sophia dares us to imagine a faith fully reconciled with the body, with the feminine, with Mother Earth, the mother of all God's peoples, histories, and cultures. What would it feel like to think and pray with a God who is not fixed like a great marble statue in the elite and faraway spaces where power is exercised, but who enters without reserve into the stream of our humble tasks, decisions, and commitments. Perhaps such a God would reignite our hope, our capacity to imagine again. I want to conclude with some thoughts about being a teacher and looking back over the course of now some 20 years in the classroom. Really, the coolest thing about, about being a teacher is the privilege and the grace and the challenge of introducing these gifts of the contemplative life to young people who are desperately thirsty for it, as I was when I was 15, and as we all are. And in the background, you'll see some slides. Uh, every year, I take a group of students to Gethsemane and am hosted by Brother Paul and other generous monks who uh, allow us to uh, visit and to share the space with them and to pray and to be silent. For the first time this year, I assigned all of my freshman theology students, so if you, you don't mind running the slides uh, so we could see some of those images, I want to just mention, quote, one of my students who, after reading an essay by Merton called Rain and the Rhinoceros, to my mind, one of his most powerful essays. My student wrote this. Like most students, she was brand new to Merton. She wrote in her journal as follows. Over the course of 10 pages, Thomas Merton made me the most confused college student in the world. <laughs> <laughs> by the time I finished reading those same 10 pages the second time, Thomas Merton made me feel like one of the most enlightened people on the planet. The way Merton writes reminds me of the way waves crash on the shore of a beach. He makes a statement that hits you and then slowly seduces you into believing whatever he wants you to believe. Like waves crashing on the shores of our consciousness, Merton writes, I think, by rhythms that we recognize but have forgotten, as he puts it in Rain and the Rhinoceros, rhythms that are not those of the engineer. I don't be, pretend to be able to explain it, but Merton's writings do not just paint pretty pictures for the imagination. The effect of reading Merton is not just psychological or aesthetic, but it is metaphysical mystical, theological. What is at stake between Merton, his reader, and all those letters and spaces dancing on the page, much like that nine-year-old child sitting at the piano in the dark, is the discernment of the profoundest truth at the deepest heart of things. Like fish swimming in an ocean of grace, we need to be reminded, this is water, this is water. A last thought. 
Sixty years ago, Merton had already described our world as a post-Christian world. Peace in a post-Christian era was the title of the book that his superiors judged too hot to publish. And no wonder. Merton's writings on war and peace still cut today like a knife. Merton confronted his contemporaries with some very uncomfortable questions. Does faith have a future? If so, what kind of faith will it be? Faith in God? Faith in the markets? Faith in technology? Faith in atomic weaponry? Drone strikes and a national security state? Fundamentalist faith, which is to say faith not in God, but in our idea of God, in the absolute truth of one's own faith. All others be damned. And as a parent, as a teacher, as a Catholic theologian, these are the questions that keep me coming back to Merton and which convince me that we still haven't yet caught up with Thomas Merton. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. I'm very flattered to be in this company. Uh, many of my friends from growing up may be a little surprised to see me in this company. Um, I'll begin by recalling something Sister Veronique Girums said to me about 10 years ago. She is a Trappist nun who lives at Redwoods Monastery in far northern California. Sister Veronique got to know Thomas Merton in 1968 when he came to her monastery twice. In describing Merton, Sister Veronique said, the mundane, if we call daily life mundane, and the sacred was together for him. Now she punctuated this by sacred and together like that, just showing how intertwined they were. And I greatly appreciated that observation. Um, I also wondered at what I was doing. Deep in the redwoods, interviewing a nun about the life of a Trappist monk. Making a film about monks had not been my plan when I moved to Los Angeles in the mid-1970s. I was going to be a director of great films like The Godfather or Mean Streets or at least Harold and Maude. <laughs> how did I wind up at Redwoods Monastery? And for that matter, how did I wind up here today? Well, the journey starts with childhood. I had two very loving parents who read to me and my sisters every night. And the stories, they were the greatest stories in the world. They were Greek myths and the tales of King Arthur's court. Aside from being great adventures, these told one everything one needed to know about being human. And they established some understanding of what truly matters in life. My mother took us to Sunday school most weeks. Most of, because of this, I felt like I had a relationship of sorts with this being that was called either God or Jesus. I have one particular vivid memory, something like Chris's, of a time when I was about five or six. And uh, in my dream, this being came to me. And I, this was the being I'd been learning about. And, spoke simply and said, my name is God, what is yours? <laughs> and I didn't answer, but I remember waking in a sun-filled room with this wonderful feeling of peace and well-being and also this regret of sorts that I hadn't answered the question. And as I got older, I could recall praying on many nights, often quite fervently, because I'd been told that praying was a good thing. And my prayers were formulaic and heartfelt, but not really intimate, I wouldn't say. And if you're wondering, the answer is no. God was no longer talking to me in my sleep or anywhere else that I could notice. At some point in my early teens, I brought this prayer life to a close, telling God one night that he, and I had been told that God was definitely a he, telling him that he probably wouldn't be hearing from me for a while. 
<laughs> but I, I hedged this by saying that he could look forward to me getting back to him at a later date. <laughs> it was like we were breaking up, but I still wanted to be friends. <laughs> And after that, it gets sort of fuzzy, and which is not too surprising, because that was about the time that my consuming interest became alcohol and other means of obliterating any trace of who I actually might be. This continued through college and well into my 20s. That was when I returned home from my time in Los Angeles. My dream of making big budget films had been that, just that, a, a dream with not much follow through and a lack of the necessary skills. So I came back to my hometown. It was a cold and gray winter. Sound familiar? And despite this bleak setting, there were some good things. I, I was reading a new variety of great stories, stories by people like Kurt Vonnegut. And then, for some reason, I read The Seven Story Mountain. And something changed. I mean, honestly, many aspects of the book turned me off. But I was attracted to this person who had written it. I mean, no doubt he had this great writing style, but he also had this passion and this commitment, this certainty about a spiritual life that struck me. He had written a great story about a journey where he had found meaning. And I wanted that. I, I needed that. So I, I thought it would be a lark to go see where he had lived. I figured that at worst, it could be an offbeat adventure that I could joke about at parties. I went for the weekend and was changed for life. And hearing that, I know how glib it sounds, but there is truth in it. What changed? My entire orientation to living changed. What did it? Well, there were many factors, but if I could point to one thing, it was simply being still, really still, and for the first time in a long time, being open to wonder. Wonder in what? Well, in the monks, in their chant, in the woods surrounding the monastery, in the sky, in the ants that were in my room, in life. That's where it started. In the stillness and wonder of that weekend, I could sense in my mundane life something sacred. I left that weekend with a wonderful feeling of peace and well-being and a glad, gladness that this time I was responding to a presence that had spoken to me. It's been almost 40 years since that weekend. I can look back and, and analyze much of this awakening and know what a psychologist would point out. A confused, slightly depressed, underachieving young man, desperate for some sense of purpose, clutches at a straw that is offered by a gifted writer. And there could be truth in that analysis. But there are also these gifts that have endured for four, some 40 years. The qualities I initially admired in Merton, passion, commitment, and certainty, I have embraced and been able to retain them. Well, the first two, anyway. I, I don't mind the absence of certainty that much. As Merton wrote, and I will loosely paraphrase, faith means doubt, and any person of faith who has never had doubt is not a person of faith. Another gift that has endured for me is the power of Merton's writing. The Merton writing I love, as well as the many wonderful books written about him, are like the walking stick used by the traveler in the poster for this festival. It supports me, these writings. Merton has supported me and, po and pointed me to other great writers and seekers of truth. For me, perhaps Merton's most significant gift has been his great generosity in sharing how he struggled to find his truth. This has helped me in my struggles as well. Yes, since that epiphany weekend, there have been many highs and many lows. As the years go by, Merton has helped me to see that, this, that in the struggle, there is life, and it is sacred. There is a final gift that has endured and continued to grow. 
Merton, my admiration for him, my films, my attempts to tell good stories about great people has opened me to a nurturing group of friends. We all know that any trip is helped by friends. They are people like you, people like the monks at Gethsemane. One of them will speak right after me, Brother Paul Quinnen. In my last film about Thomas Merton, I interviewed Brother Paul about the experience of being taught by Merton. He shared that Merton often used the phrase, you see, when teaching. Now, ending a sentence with the phrase, you see, was essentially sort of a con conversational tick that Merton had. But Paul points out it was also illustrative of what Merton was doing, helping Paul and the other novices to see. I suspect Merton has helped us all see in some way, which brings me back to my friend, Sister Veronique of the Redwoods. Through people like her and Merton, I see better. One of the things I see, a vision that sustains me on this journey that I dare to call sacred, is this. The mundane, if we call our daily lives mundane, and the sacred are together. Thank you. I love bourbon, and by that very fact, I love Kentucky. <laughs> so, um, you know, what can I say about Merton uh, without talking about myself? In a sense, um, my own story is almost inseparable from my uh, experience with Merton because uh, my life with Merton started so early. Uh, I was 17 years old when I came to the monastery. And so uh, ever since then, it's kind of like uh, a theme running through my life. So would I say I was a disciple of Thomas Merton? Actually, that's not exactly the truth. I wouldn't say I was a disciple of Thomas Merton. And, and Father Lewis, I call him Father Lewis, pardon me, that's a, how we called him at the monastery. So Father Lewis at one time said, uh, call, do not call any man father, uh, you have one father in heaven. And uh, you, you, you know, Christ, you are disciples of Christ. And, you know, he really believed that. I, I think that's kind of the attitude he wanted us to have about himself. So, um, nevertheless, uh, uh, I wouldn't, I would call him my mentor. And I think he's a mentor for many people. Uh, he's one of those people you can consult and you sort of stop and bend an ear to what he might have to say, say about something or other and then go back to thinking about the issue on your own terms. Now that is precisely what he would want you to do. He didn't want you to look for answers in what he had to say, what he wrote. He wanted you to look at the issue yourself. So that, that point that you were making about, uh, he, he would end up a sentence by saying, you see, and well, that's, that's the, the point, that you see. He wants, uh, there are things that maybe you haven't looked at, well, let's look at it, and then you see, and see with your own eyes and with your own mind. So that's very much his, own, his approach. That's how he treated people. Um, so uh, just to kind of st start a little bit uh, ahead of myself, I would say in, um, you know, I had him for my spiritual director. You know, as a novice, you had to go see the, novice master every other week and uh, he would treat me like an equal uh, here I was 17 going on 18 and now I'm 74 going on 19 <laughs> <laughs> but he would treat me as an equal I, I didn't have the feeling that he was talking down to me at all and well I mean, that was very reassuring because, uh, you know, I felt, well, 
okay, I can be an adult. Uh, and I was very much into a, an imitative mode with relationship to him to begin with um, because I had read the Seven Story Mountain before I, I came to the monastery. I was in high school. And um, it was one of those books that Cap, you know, Catholics knew about. So I, I had read The Imitation of Christ, and that really made me think seriously about, well, it related me to Christ because it, the whole book is a dialogue between the soul and Christ. I got into that dialogue, and it's continuing, even until this morning, as you <laughs> might have heard earlier on. Um, then I read the seven. Well, so I thought a monastery is a wonderful place. You know that you can go and live. You know, you're in relationship to Christ all the time. You're. I wanted to continue that. I wanted to have you know the, this source of of love. Which was so immediate and so imminent, I wanted to have that all the time. So I thought, oh, okay, monastery. Well, where am I going to go? I guess I'll have to go to Europe. There aren't any monasteries in the United States, are there? <laughs> so I was willing to go to Europe. I had already studied uh, two years of French. So, okay, I'll go to Europe. But then I, I read the Seven Story Mountain. I said, oh, so there's an American monastery, the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. I'll go there. So I wrote to Gethsemane. I didn't know there were other monasteries, even some closer to home. Uh, but uh, th so as I say, I was into something of an imitative mode. And so uh, Merton talks about playing the bongo drums up <laughs> in, in New York. So I got some bongo drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I wasn't very good at it. And then he talked about, you know, in the Seven Story Mountain, going from one church to another. When he'd go to Rome or someplace, he'd be, you know, he'd go to the churches. So I, uh, before I entered the monastery, I crossed the country to help out my brother on his construction site. And I would stop in churches. Um, you know, but it was kind of a good thing. You know, I thought, well, here's a model. I was following this model. And, and I, when I went to London... Uh, I did the same thing. I, I crossed all the way from St. Paul's to uh, Trafalgar Square, and I stopped on a church. And I found out a lot about England, about the religious state of religious life in, in, in London, just by stopping in at the churches. You could pick up things psychically. It's interesting. So there I was, a kind of a young man in an imitative mode with regard to Thomas Merton. And uh, then I uh, met this guy called Father Lewis, and he was pretty kind of, you know, uh, interesting and, and friendly. And he said, well, we'll take you over, and we can go out in the woods and start chomp chomping down trees and things like that. Uh, so, but I was still looking around. Which guy, which one is Thomas Merton here? And uh, the one I kind of picked out was kind of tall, statuesque, black hair, angular face, uh, but it wasn't him. I found out it wasn't him because I found out that my novice master was Thomas Merton. Father Lewis was Thomas Merton. It took me a whole month to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a darn good thing because by then he wasn't Thomas Merton. He was Father Lewis, and he was there to be mentor. Um, so I would say I'm still in that mode. Uh, he's, his book's do that for me. Um, I don't read them intensively. I, I love I love reading him when I'm uh, in solitude at the Hermitage. I'll go up to the Hermitage and spend a week. A really great place to read the private journals. Good time to read the private journals. And uh, some of you know I take groups up there. And when I take a group up there, I'll pull out the private journal blindly and pick the day we're on and then read what he has to say on this day, you know, from 1948 to 58 or something. And by golly, it always speaks to the group. There's always something that's right on target. So, you know, even when it comes to chancing, he speaks. He, he's a mentor. So the whole thing about the Thomas Merton group that meets uh, the, always the last Sunday of the month, 
um, four o'clock. It's open. Um, he continues to be a mentor. I, so I don't read a lot of Merton anymore. I, uh, I've read almost everything. But, uh, you know, he, he continues as a voice. And when I, you know, get together with people like these, you know, he continues to be a voice. The conversation is going on. Uh, and that's, that's how I relate to, to Merton. Uh, just one thing that, that I picked up in, uh, um, yeah, in that in that, vid that that tape that he played. Um, he says that uh, in the last years I have been backing away from the community and into solitude, <laughs> and uh, th that made me think of a dream I had as a novice. Uh, I, th uh, that I talked to him about when I went in for spiritual direction. I was driving down a highway, and a car passed me on the left, and the driver was Father Lewis, but he was facing my direction. He's driving, you know. So I told him that dream, and um, it's amazing how that dream really, he was backing away from the monastery. You know, he was driving backwards, but he was, we were going in the same direction. <laughs> so um, that pretty much states the relationship we had uh, as director and directee at that point. He was actually pulling back from the life I was going into. I was trying to get into the community life. He was trying to get out of the community life. And the, the, the amazing thing is that Dom James would let a man like that be the novice master. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, and yet, he, you know, he, his attitude was that it's your vocation. And, and what that gave to me was a sense of the freedom of the life, that, that the monastery is not just a, a fixed, rigid place. People can have a variety of vocations within it. He was sort of like shifting to a more solitary kind of life. And this kind of left a lot of wiggle room. You know, it shows you what, you, you know, that you've got the monastery, but then you've got your own vocation to, to work out. And that's what it did for me. I think the, the, uh, um, the fact that he was sort of trying to get into a different kind of mode of monastic life gave me a sense of, the deep value of solitude. I probably wouldn't have gotten that so much from a, an ordinary, you know, Cistercian novice master, but with him, that, that deep rootedness in solitude has remained with me. So there are many things. And then, of course, you know, the, the whole th the business about writing, um, um, that's just kind of happened. Most of it started happening after he died. I didn't, I guess I felt overshadowed. I wouldn't dare write poetry in with him around, uh, <laughs> although he, I wrote a poem as a novice and he put it up on the bulletin board. <laughs> um, but I did most of my writing after that. Uh, but there again, you know, it was like, okay, I'm not gonna say it's due to Thomas Merton or the fact that I do photography is due to Thomas Merton because he did photography. It's not an imitative thing. It's just like I've, I've assimilated something of the vitality of, of the, man, the man and the vitality of the monastic life. And then I've let it come out in these ways uh, because I could see it happening. I mean, there are other great men of just having great minds, uh, world-class, you know, comp composer like Chris, Chris Agnes Lobel, uh, John Hughes Bamberger, they're great people. Um, and they've, they've all contributed to my life. I'm supposed to keep this down to 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to wind up right now and say that um, all of this that happens in my life is really a part of my own prayer life, uh, uh, that it, 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 most of all, it's a matter of unity in prayer. I think he's still there in all of that in, in my prayer life, and he, I can really tell he, he's that in your prayer life and other people's prayer life, the people that come to the monastery, you had that question about, well, what is it that influences them? Well, I think somehow he gets, he gets into their prayer. Uh, they, they can hear 
They, they, when they read Thomas Merton, they hear a voice that is something of their own voice. And he even put it that way himself. They can hear, they can, they can feel a heart that is like the heart that they themselves have and maybe didn't even know that they have it, but which is something that comes awake in the quiet moments and that comes awake in the, you know, the basic quest that we all have in our search for God. So we all share in the same spirit, and each one of us is a kind of a face of the Holy Spirit. Thomas Merton is a face of the Holy Spirit for many of us. Amen. Well, we've all heard the voices of my friends, our friends, and now we can listen to your voices. I invite you to ask any question you might have, and hopefully it's a general enough question that any of us, uh, any of the panelists rather, uh, could answer rather than address to a specific person. I'm also of the mind uh, to give you the freedom to rather than ask a question, that you very briefly, uh, tersely, uh, might tell us of your response to this session, uh, or what is it about Thomas Merton that brings you here and that, that turns you on? And, and, and again, if, if, you, if you wish to do that, rather than ask a question, uh, be as direct as you, as you can. We have, we have 10 minutes. So the floor is open. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, first of all, someone wanted to know a bumper sticker or, uh, and my suggestion is 100 bottles of beer on the wall, 100 years of Thomas Merton. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, this week in the Catholic tradition is Ascension Thursday. And since he was ordained, I believe on Ascension, I think it would have been a Thursday. So this Thursday might be an appropriate day to remember him as becoming Father Lewis, officially. My question is, or, uh, where I heard that he rumored to have fathered a child, I immediately thought of Augustine, who had a child, Deodatos, out of wedlock, uh, Dorothy Day, who had an abortion before she had her daughter, Tamar. So my reflection is, um, when people have feelings of guilt or shame in their sexuality, where does, where might Merton be a, uh, I mean, more than just a rumor? Did he ever admit that? Is it one of the secrets about him that's, that you dance around? And therefore, could, and where could he be a model for people about guilt and shame in relationship to their sexuality? Well, he did, he did admit the fact to me as an office master. He uh, you know, said that he had had a child. He was kind of blushing at the time, too. I'm not sure he ever did, uh, you know, I don't think he's an answer uh, to the, that whole issue. Um, but he, there again, he's like a traveling companion. <laughs> and, he, and he didn't hide it. I mean, you, you, can, you can see your own problems in, in, in his in his problems, so uh, um, he wouldn't pretend to have answers. But it, finally, he did make a choice for solitude. That's as much as I'm gonna say. I might just add that it's not accidental. I think that the sixth volume of the private journals is the best selling, <laughs> uh, the account of his affair, his relationship with, with M. And I, I, I would say personally that I, I mentioned briefly, you know, I think as Merton, earlier I mentioned that Merton dares us to imagine a, a God who, uh, a holistic spirituality in which our, in which matter, earth, in which our bodies are part of our journey. And I, I think that was a long struggle for him. I, I think the Dalai Lama described him as a very embodied person in his body, very physical 
very comfortable in his body, but I, I don't know that that would have been true early. So I think in Merton, people see a reflection of their own sometimes struggle with around issues of guilt and sexuality and um, who is my true self as a person, as an embodied person, as a sexual being. And I do, I do think that's one reason why he's, he's attractive. I don't think he had it all figured out, as, as Brother Paul said, but I, I think we see in him, very often people see in him, some reflection of their own struggle to live holistically and, and in a healthy way in that, in that regard. Yeah, I think there's so many things in his youth that he then comes back to later on. You know, things like his interest in, in, in Gandhi, his interest in issues to do with war and peace and other faiths, they're all there before he becomes a, a Christian and a Catholic. And similarly, his relationship with this woman at Cambridge or whatever it was, we don't know the details. And yet he keeps on coming back to those things. But as his faith, his relationship with God develops, he comes back to them in a, a new way. And I think some, you know, we see that with his writings then on, on peace, other faiths, and then also as he struggles with his relationships with women and works through that, through with that affair in 66. Uh, my name is Jim McGee. And as we listen to uh, the brother from the uh, from California speaking to us, he, he, he invited us to go deep enough into our own tradition until we reach the point where all traditions meet. And, that, and I was moved to tears when I heard that. Um, and it, it was comforting that I don't have to abandon my own tradition in order to explore others. And, in, and I, I recall reading in, in his Asian journal where Merton says that, that um, I have to be grounded in my own tradition deeply in order to explore um, the traditions of other people in Asia. Um, I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on where you have experienced going deep into your tradition and finding that point where all traditions meet. And share just briefly that uh, after college I spent some time in, in Colorado I packed up a van and with all my music equipment and uh, from Lexington Kentucky out to uh, Boulder Colorado to study at a small Buddhist college called Naropa Institute now now called Naropa University which was founded by a Buddhist uh, teacher from Tibet named Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche so there was this whole American Buddhist community in Boulder that I suddenly was you know, a cradle Catholic was, uh, my parents were terrified. <laughs> they were sure I was going to come back, you know, with my head shaved and wearing saffron robes. And, but, but what I found, uh, and what they found, my parents found, uh, just to echo your comment, that there was nothing to fear in, in that immersion in the wisdom of another tradition. In fact, you know, within two, three years, I was sort of drawn back into my own Catholic tradition, but at a much deeper level, I think, at, from those deeper wellsprings of, of, of common uh, experience uh, of, of meditation and mysticism and all those places that Merton invited people into. And so that sort of digression, if you want to call it that, was no digression. In fact, it brought me back in a deeper way to my own tradition and elements of my tradition that had never been taught to me. That was the other revelation, that there's this whole aspect of the Catholic tradition that was completely uh, unfamiliar to me. And so Merton in a roundabout way, but also the, the Buddhist tradition in a very direct way, it reintroduced me to my own Catholic roots. Yeah, I've been asked, well, why would you want to make another film about Merton? You've made one. Well, one thing, 
quite honestly, this is his 100th birthday. So it, it seemed like a good idea in that sense. But also that message of Merton's that you can be very, by being secure in your own tradition, it's okay to, you know, to grow and meet and talk and communicate with others. And that's really what I tried to focus this new film on, that mission, not mission, but that path of Merton's to do that. And because I think it is so important today uh, that reaching out and communicating is just couldn't be more important. I think that we uh, can continue together to reach out uh, to one another, for we all represent different traditions, really. Uh, no matter what faith uh, discipline uh, we follow, uh, we, are, we are all uh, not only uh, often strangers to ourselves, but each of us uh, is a whole community of diversity and traditions and thought and wisdom. And we should take this opportunity, if you don't mind my being imperative about it, uh, to, uh, during this festival of faiths, to reach out toward one another and to speak to one another, not just attend uh, these sessions. And the Center for Interfaith Relations has actually, the, the staff, has, has made it a possibility for us to reach out to one another. Uh, there is a phenomenon that they are this year calling a tea room, which is on the mezzanine uh, as we go out. Uh, I am going to be there every day uh, hosting and, and greeting anyone who wants to come up to relax. There are couches up there. And simply to talk, simply to, to, uh, to reflect on, on what's happening and, and what you've thought. And so that's every day. There's a tea room between uh, noon and, and the next uh, session at two o'clock. Then also I want to tell you that another option besides eating uh, between noon and, and two is a, what we're calling uh, meditation in motion. Uh, today it's Tai Chi, and it's going to take place in front of the Kentucky Center, very close to Actors Theater, and there will be a group, there will be someone waiting outside uh, of this auditorium gathering those who wish to go over and, and do Tai Chi, who, who, want, who want to relax. So I invite you uh, to continue this conversation uh, that we have begun this morning. Uh, we are going to look forward uh, this afternoon to a wonderful session called The True Self, uh, a concept that was very dear uh, to Thomas Merton uh, and in his writing. So that will be between uh, two and four, and tonight, uh, Teddy Abrams, this very young, I understand, 27-year-old, uh, wunderkind uh, conductor of the Louisville Orchestra is going to have a musical presentation to us uh, between seven and nine. So there is much to look forward to. Uh, we thank you for your kindness in uh, being present to us uh, and to our stories, and uh, let the conversation continue.